Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Dina Jensen, the director of the Center for Nonprofit Leadership at California Lutheran University, and I'd love to extend a warm welcome to everyone signing on to this morning's webinar and adaptive leadership practices. Um, we have a terrific virtual discussion planned for this morning with a few of our region's most respected nonprofit executive leaders. Uh, the past nine weeks have demanded leadership from our sector and its leaders unlike any time before. And we're honored to create the space to share ideas, lessons, and explore the challenges and demands of our COVID-19 climate. A very special thanks to Jeff Green, who will serve as today's moderator, posing provocative questions and sharing his own insights to the discussion. We acknowledge up front that none of us has all the answers and at the moment and that community, state and global developments are fast paced and change moment by moment. We've invited honest reflections from our colleagues on how each is managing and leading through this current time. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to get, uh, take a quick moment uh, to express our sincere gratitude to today's sponsors, the Ventura County Community Foundation and Montecito Bank and Trust. Uh, because of their generosity, these sessions are free to attend. We're grateful to Cal Lutheran and our own advisory board for making the commitment to our region's nonprofit sector um, as we navigate these demanding times. If you'd like to make a personal contribution to support and keep these webinars free of charge, I'll go ahead and put a link into the chat box and welcome gifts of any size. This session is also made possible through a collaborative partnership of capacity building partners across our region. Uh, the Center for Nonprofit Leadership is beyond grateful uh, to the following partners at the Nonprofit Resource Network in Santa Barbara, the Ventura County Community Foundation, the Santa Barbara Foundation, the Fund for Santa Barbara, the Association of Fundraising Professionals, Santa Barbara and Ventura County's chapter, Just Communities, Leading from Within, and Visionality, who's providing Zoom hosting services in support of today's learning community. A special thanks to Brianne and Emily from the Visionality team. The session will be recorded and made available after today's webinar, and we kindly invite you to use the Q&A feature to post questions throughout today's session. Uh, we'll be curating those questions and um, Jeff will be feeding them to our panelists. Um, if you experience any difficulties with the Zoom platform, not posing a question, but I'm having a problem hearing, seeing, navigating, you're welcome to use the chat function to communicate directly with the Visionality team. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to what I think is one of our region's master moderators, someone that we all emulate when we sit in the moderator chair, um, the one and only Jeff Green, the CEO of the Santa Barbara City College Foundation and a partner and friend and trusted ally to the nonprofit sector. So Jeff, I'm gonna hand it over to you, welcome. Thank you so much, Dina, and uh, I'll extend my welcome to everyone as well. It's uh, wonderful to see everyone uh, here, or uh, it's that C in finger quotes, of course, see everyone here. Um, all bets are off through mediated technology, so I'll do my best to do what we, we would normally do in a real room together, uh, but I'm very grateful for the opportunity to do this uh, with you all. I, I really do look forward to our conversation this morning. I, I have to acknowledge that, of course, we're we're in a, one of the toughest moments um, of our history in the nonprofit sector and, of course, in our communities. Uh, but we're also in one of the most creative. So I, I think there's this tension that we're all living through where we have uh, incredible opportunities that were really forced upon us and uh, how we respond to those and, and what our leadership does is, is key. So this morning, we've invited three outstanding leaders. Um, these are friends and colleagues to many of us, uh, people for whom we have great respect uh, they lead critical organizations. They do it in a regional way. They do it with a, a great sense of, of partnership and collegiality. Uh, and they have some big fights to fight from time to time. So the, the genesis of this conversation, the idea behind holding this, this webinar this morning in this fashion, was really to invite um, three folks uh, who could reflect on what this moment means to them, to their organizations, uh, and to talk about really what it means to lead a nonprofit organization through the, the multiple layers of the challenges that we're currently facing. We're, of course, facing near depression era unemployment. We're facing market volatility. We're facing uh, some of our most already marginalized community members living on the edge, uh, being forced even further 
uh, down uh, on the economic ladder. Uh, we are facing the tension within families who are forced to all stay at home and live together and run their school day and do all the things that people do. Um, and so there's just a lot happening at once. And so the three folks that we have with us this morning, uh, we've asked to get honest with us and we, we want brutal honesty. Um, in fact, just to show you the kind of brutal honesty, I'm gonna quote one of our panelists um, in, in her Facebook posting about today, this morning's session when she was referring to the adaptive leadership practices title. She said, and I quote, I suspect that adaptive leadership is our sector's jargon for quote, figuring shit out on the fly. Uh, and that is truth. And that was Sigrid, right. So um, thank you, Sigrid, for that reflection. I'm just gonna out you right there. So to start with, I wanna introduce our three panelists. And we're going to give them each uh, about 10 minutes to say a few words about their work and their experience. Uh, and then we will uh, have a conversation for the remaining time. So to give some formal uh, background for those who may or may not know, uh, first, I want to introduce Sigrid Wright. Sigrid is the CEO of Community Environmental Council. Um, she's got a quarter century of experience in nonprofit environmental management in multiple organizations. Many of you know that Sigrid was with the organization uh, for a number of years before she was named CEO. Uh, she is on a steering committee and uh, a partner in many ways. She's on the Central Coast Climate Collaborative, the Alliance of Regional Collaboratives for Climate Adaptation. You know that climate is one of her passions. Uh, she has been an author of many documents uh, within the Community Environmental Council, and you may have seen her writing as of late, as well as her, um, her curation of key writings for us all to read and videos for us to watch if you're on the CEC list. Um, she was an author of the Food Action Plan, uh, the Santa Barbara County Regional Energy Blueprint. And uh, for many, they, you know her as the architect behind the Santa Barbara Earth Day Festival. So for 15 years, she led the annual Earth Day production. And we'll talk about what that meant in this year's 50th anniversary that had to go virtual. So I am delighted to welcome Sigurd Wright uh, to, the, to the conversation this morning. We also have with us Maricela Morales. Uh, Maricela has been with PAWS, the Central Coast Alliance United for a Sustainable Economy, one of the best acronyms I've ever come across. Uh, and she has been there since the beginning. She came on uh, first as a volunteer, actually, with the Living Wage Coalition in Ventura County, uh, and then joined the team when there was a staff to join starting in 2001, which is in uh, 01 when the cause organization became an official 501c3 nonprofit. Um, she's worked on a wide range of issues. You hear Maricela's voice on everything from uh, economic justice, uh, women's economic justice, a green economy, uh, health coverage for all people. There's a lot of, of places where Causa's work uh, is, is key and forefronted. She is a, a local native. Uh, she grew up in Ventura County, went to Fillmore schools, uh, and, uh, and went on from there. She was also elected, so she has not only done her work in the nonprofit sector, but uh, was mm -hmm. Port Wainimi City Council uh, as the first Latina elected to that council in 2002, and then went on to become the first Latina mayor in 2007. So we welcome you. Thank you so much, Maricela, for joining us. Uh, and last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Jenna Tosh. She is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Planned Parenthood of the Central Coast, uh, which she uh, has had in that seat since 2015. Uh, that is a tri-county chapter. Uh, she holds her doctorate in public affairs from the University of Central Florida, uh, where she actually studied her very work that she now does in practice, which is reproductive uh, health policies and their impact on, on teens in particular. Um, she started her work with Planned Parenthood in 2005 in Orlando, Florida, uh, where she ultimately did become the CEO uh, before moving here to our, join our community. Um, and I want to welcome you, Jenna, for, for uh, thank you for joining us this morning. So those are our three panelists. And uh, at this point, I'm going to be quiet and I'm going to turn it over uh, to Sigrid to give a few introductory remarks. Wonderful. Uh, well, I'm really glad to be here. And um, Jeff, I was just reflecting the last couple of weeks that um, the people who seem to really have an advantage right now are those who are comfortable with being bald. So I think, <clears throat> I think you got it, you and, uh, you and Gary got it. And even better now for people who have big ears because I'm finding those masks really aren't fitting. So, so we're in a new territory. I'm gonna start just by talking about um, CEC and the impact on the organization. And then I look forward to the, the broader conversation um, a little later about you know how this may be a, uh, affecting the environmental movement and, and the social sector in general but um, so CEC is uh, 
was started in 1970. We are turning 50 years old this year. Um, very solutions oriented organization for the last 15 years. We've been focused on climate solutions. Prior to that, we focused on things like recycling, hazardous waste reduction, environmental education, organic ag. Um, we've been in a growth mode for about the last um, four years. We've seen about an 80% growth in our operating budget. So it's been pretty rapid growth mode. And in the last few years, we've really been transitioning to network-based work. So for the initial years that we were working on climate, we were kind of the only folks in the space. And now there are, mercifully, there's a lot of, um, a lot of organizations. And that, does, that means that we are moving from kind of these individual or organization-based projects that we conceive of and implement <clears throat> into much more uh, uh, partnership and network-based. Um, our team is very energetic and fast paced and comprised of system thinkers who are kind of paid to worry about the future. So we spend a lot of time talking and thinking about and advocating for basic human rights like clean air, clean water, healthy food, livable climate. So that is, um, that's just kind of the background on the organization. And then like all of you, I feel like we took a sharp turn at a fast pace on a blind corner. In, um, and it felt for the first few weeks or month, uh, months that everything kind of went into a slide and like we were just kind of hanging in midair. And, it, and initially it actually even felt a bit like an identity crisis that um, because it was really impacting everything that defines CEC. So all of those, those words I just used before, productivity, social connectivity, the ability to work with partners, all of that um, really went into limbo. Um, and many of our partners are nonprofit partners who were dealing with their own crisis. And then we also partner quite a bit with cities and counties of all three counties, Ventura, San Luis Obispo, and Santa Barbara. Um, and those county, city and county staff were um, pulled into emergency management. Um, on a personal level, I felt, you know, I was really struggling that first month. I, um, we went from this rapid growth into this um, slight contraction plans that we'd been putting, that working on for years were put on to hold, were put on hold. As I mentioned, it's our 50th anniversary. So this is a, a year we had been planning for uh, many years. This was supposed to kind of be our moment. Um, climate change was finally on the public agenda. A, it wasn't just us, um, you know, in a semi-crowded room. It was, it really felt like people were there. Youth were bringing in um, that kind of vitality and moral authority. Um, we were completing our five-year strategic plan and about to launch a major fundraising campaign. And then, um, and then on a personal level, this is also my 25th anniversary year. And so it really had felt like we, we and I were kind of made for this moment and then we were all sent home. Um, so I tend to tend to kind of look for the meaning in things. And I do have some perspective on what all this could mean from an environmental or ecosystems standpoint, and which we can get into a little bit later. But I'll, I thought I'd talk first about the five key place, places where we have really felt this um, impact on an organizational level. Um, the first place was on gatherings and events. We're a very um, event-driven organization. We <laughs> average two to three, sometimes four events a month. Um, and we were feeling the impacts even before the official shelter in place, um, the couple of weeks prior when we started to hear about preparing for social distancing. And I had some immediate concern around that. Um, from uh, some of that concern is because from a cl our climate resilience work, we know that social connectivity is really the, the number one strategy for resilience. Um, more than any other strategy, more than evacuation plans or alert systems. Um, it's really that neighbor to neighbor connection and that mutual aid that is um, that really does build resilience. So I, I did have some concerns about that. Um, on a kind of logistic level, we saw dozens of our own gatherings being canceled from house parties to our leadership breakfasts. The biggest event that we had to deal with was Earth Day and that was in mid April and that was also the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. We're, we've also canceled our Green Gala, which is our, our primary fundraiser. But I do want to talk a little bit more later um, the pivot we did on Earth Day under Kathy King's leadership and what we learned from that, because I think it was, first of all, it was very early in all of this, and I think it was instrumental. Uh, the second place where we really felt the impact, like everybody, was just in the work environment. Um, 
again, our team's been growing over the past couple of years, so we've already had to address those work structures and flexible workspace and shared workspace with some teammates working at home. We were already in cloud-based systems, um, but I did still kind of have that typical employer's discomfort with large-scale remote work, and I've had to work, th work through that and put some um, um, systems into place, but um, I did find early that it helped to fall back on a couple of key values of the organization and that is that i think we built this culture of trust within the organization and that we are a learning organization that we're, we're willing to experiment and share and expect and 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 um and reflect on what we're learning along the way so we did take some logistical responses that included some very simple things like moving into Microsoft Teams, presented a little bit of challenge because we do have some of our teams that work in another system. Um, right off the bat, I identified one staff member for tech support, um, could be called at any time, day or night for staff and board. And then we went quickly from um, bi-monthly bi staff meetings, so uh, twice a month to weekly staff meetings I still um, was challenged by that in the first couple of weeks. Um, trying to read body language on tiny Zoom squares is really hard. And, you know, I hadn't realized, I knew that I relied on kind of emotional intelligence for management, but I hadn't realized um, how much of my day-to-day decision-making really is based on hundreds of little micro bits of information on um, body language and simple verbal cues. Mm -hmm. So we started employing in our, um, staff meetings, the Zoom breakout rooms, right at the beginning of the staff meeting, we spend more time on just processing and social connectivity, um, longer check-ins. You know, everybody is processing something, whether it's worry or grief. I'd say about half of our staff have had um, other financial impacts to their households. So spouses or partners losing jobs or having wages cut. Everyone's dealing with concern about a family member or mental health. In my own family, um, we lost my husband's brother, um, most likely to COVID. So we had to make a lot of um, space in our, in our staff meetings and continue to do so to allow um, for everyone's kind of whole selves to show up. The third place where we felt this impact was um, just on financial unknowns. We started in a really financially healthy position with some good protocols. We have staff who are budget owners. We have strong finance board finance committee. We have clear financial reports. And we normally do a mid-year budget forecast, but it has required um, t stopping and what I would say taking more um, like compass point readings uh, more frequently. Um, but because of those things, we haven't had to take, uh, we didn't have to take drastic reactive measures. And we had focused the first couple of months just on getting a reading. We have taken a few measures, which included um, hiring uh, a hiring freeze on open positions. We've loaned one staff member to Food Bank to keep her employed because uh, she was an events coordinator. Um, we're most likely going to need to reduce a few benefits, and we've taken some other expense reductions. Um, and on the income side, we really we had a diverse revenue streams, but really every single one of those has, has taken a hit. Grants, contracts. Um, philanthropy, our social enterprise, and we're actually even um, part owners of a local restaurant. That, so that's been a, a, a reduction as well. And so that payroll protection program was really essential. Um, the fourth place where we felt that impact is really on internal and external communications. Um, so internally, what, what I did is I started a weekly CEO report, and I think that's what you were referring to, Jeff. It started as um, a report just to my really in, inner circle board and staff, and then that um, expanded out a bit and has morphed into really more reflections. We're doing more regular check-ins on our board and our allies, particularly the, um, our elderly members. We're offering to help them with their shopping. But the real impact has been externally on our external communications. Um, we basically doubled the amount of newsletters, e-newsletters we're sending out. We're upping our socials, our blog posts. We're exploring new terrain, podcasts and video. And all of that has required just more engagements from staff, which um, I will say has been challenging because I'm asking staff to, to really um, think into things in that first month or so. I think we were all really struggling with some brain fog. Mm -hmm. And the fifth place um, where we felt impact is on the kind of shifting narrative of the environmental movement. And I'll talk more about that as we get into the discussion.
Jeff, you're muted. And there's our first technical glitch of the day. <laughs> uh, I was saying uh, thank you so much, Sigrid, for covering a lot of ground in a very short time. And we will certainly circle back to a, to a lot of that uh, momentarily here. Uh, so now, Maricela, please uh, come with us. Yes, thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, it's so important during these times, right, to, to come together and to, to connect, not just in a headspace, but also in, in community, in, um, in heart and in spirit. So happy to be with you all today. Um, one of the things that, um, for me, in, in terms of my work, but also who I am, is um, uh, the most important thing that I think um, about my bio um, that I had nothing to do with, and that is that I'm a proud daughter of Mexican immigrants. And that absolutely drives uh, me and it, it, it really drives our organization as a whole. Um, as, as an organization that is uh, rooted, um, uh, driven and, and led by people of color, um, uh, we've been going through um, crises um, uh, for a long time. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but I'd say that, you know, in terms of um, socially, you know, systemically, um, really hard hit starting November 2016. Um, we were all uh, devastated um, uh, by that. Um, uh, there's been ramifications of that presidential elections. Um, every day, um, we've all felt it in one way or another. Um, so November 2016, December 2017, the Thomas fire, um, uh, November again, 2018, more fires. Uh, November again, 2019, more fires out here in Ventura County. Um, so it really has been crisis after crisis um, for the last um, four or five years. Um, this is a different crisis, um, as uh, we've all noted and said, um, absolutely unprecedented. Um, I want to bring up a, a framework that um, I only recently learned about. Um, it's called the Kinefin framework. Um, it's a Welsh um, word that means habitat, um, but it's about decision-making domains. And within that, um, it, it um, lays out that um, um, we're, we're in this place of disorder um, and chaos. And the challenge is really to get to this new place of complexity. Um, where we normally function in a place of obvious, <laughs> what's called literally obvious decision-making domain um, and complicated, um, that's the norm. Um, and now we're in this place of disorder and chaos um, and the place that we need to move to or have had to <laughs> figure out is this place of complexity. Um, for us, um, uh, the, the, the two big um, points where we've had to um, just continue to to adjust um, is um, very much at the at the human level. So our staff, um, to what Sigrid said, um, and that we're all feeling, um, we're all feeling this. Um, and so, what is the role of employers? What is the role of a place of work um, to address mental health? Um, we're not mental health professionals. Um, work isn't the place that you come to get taken care of um, in terms of your mental health, and yet. Um, this disorder place, this place of chaos, um, given that we are humans and we are people, um, is at such a level where um, it's hard to contain it. It's hard to leave it at home, especially when you're working at home. <laughs> um, and so to lift up that mental health aspect and the challenge that it presents to us as organizational leaders, um, to try to find that balance between um, knowing that you have to step up um, um, in that um, space um, and also knowing that um, it, it's, it's not our, our role to, to, to care for it um, or address it completely. Um, and so that's completely new territory. Um, in our case, many of our staff um, are immigrants themselves they're DACA, as in they're undocumented, um, but they're, you know, quote unquote, allowed to work through DACA. Um, or we are um, sons and daughters of immigrants. And so um, we have folks on staff whose, you know, parents have been um, uh, uh, unemployed 
and have no access to any economic security. So it's, it's hitting our staff very, very um, hard. And, um, and then our work um, for our frontline st staff is to be in contact with folks who are most disenfranchised and most on the edge. And so they're um, having to, um, you know, manage and, and, and hear the stories and uh, from a place of uh, often helplessness, right? We can't change this pandemic. We can't stop it. Um, we can't offer them a job. Uh, so um, so that, um, that human piece in terms of our staff and in terms of the people that we are trying to um, be a support to and continue to serve uh, through our work. Um, so in, in terms of, of, of that piece, um, it's, um, you know, created just, uh, uh, for us, uh, an even more, um, a sense of, of urgency in terms of the advocacy work that, that, that we do. Um, so yeah, that's a, a little bit about how we've been impacted and are trying to, um, to, to manage in these times. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maricela. Um, Jenna, tell us a bit about your experience in Planned Parenthood's work. Sure. Um, well, I am actually struck by how similar um, our experiences are and, uh, you know, sort of how we all started our, remar our remarks is that we, um, uh, as organizations working uh, with immigrants, working environmental justice issues, reproductive rights, we sort of have grown accustomed a bit to crises, right, and managing through crises. And um, and I think all of our organizations have teams um, that in a lot of ways are, you know, probably sort of uniquely resilient um, and comfortable um, managing through that. And I think that's one of the things that I have found myself being um, sort of oddly grateful for. You know, it's weird to feel like that's an advantage, <laughs> um, but I think it is. And, you know, we, we certainly um, had no sort of roadmap or pandemic plan for this moment, um, but we do, uh, as an organization at Planned Parenthood, have some significant experience with contingency planning and managing through a tremendous amount um, of uncertainty. Um, you know, we, we too, you know, went back to thinking about November 2016, Maricela, you know, and, and some of the work that we did um, in that moment, um, you know, looking at, you know, some of our worst case scenario financial modeling um, and contingency plans. Um, and, you know, of course, that was because right after that election, it appeared that Congress and the new administration would gut the Affordable Care Act. Um, and defund Planned Parenthood um, and leave our patients without a healthcare provider. Um, uh, and so, you know, we actually developed our strategic plan right after that moment. And you know, the very first priority of that plan is really simple and straightforward. It's literally our doors stay open. Um, our first element, first pillar of our strategic plan is just that, um, you know, our five health centers along the Central Coast remain open and remain providing all of our critical healthcare services to our patients. And the truth is um, that mantra and that plan um, works really well for us right now. Um, you know, I think like everybody on the call at Planned Parenthood, we are experiencing um, financial uncertainty, uh, managing fear and anxiety um, from staff, uh, staff balancing childcare and work, staff whose households have been impacted by folks um, losing work, um, staff who have lost friends and relatives to COVID. Um, and, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, it's extremely stressful, right? And I think there's just no way um, to make that better um, for anyone. So, um, so we too have found ourselves really needing to anchor ourselves in core organizational values and principles um, to, to assure that, you know, we are grounded in this moment. Um, our organizational ethos internally at Planned Parenthood is in this together. We're in this together. Um, and it's actually been interesting to see that sort of become like a global ethos over the past eight weeks um, because it really works well right now, right? Like the decisions that any one of us make um, impacts people that we don't know, impacts elders, right? 
essentially life or death consequences of, of everyday decisions that we all make and that we really need to be in this together and take it seriously. Um, and that in this together ethos for us manifests in six core um, values. Um, and those are we tend to the team, uh, we respect and honor all people, we jump in, we try and we learn, we care for our business and we return to our mission. And so that's obviously not a roadmap, um, but it has been helpful and stabilizing and it's provided um, some direction. You know, from the very beginning um, of this moment, I think things have changed so much. And the, the very short first days um, of the crisis, information was coming together so quickly and it was changing, right? Even our understanding of how the virus was transmitted um, and how to protect one another changed um, dramatically um, in weeks, right? It went from there's no aerosol transmission to there probably is aerosol transmission. In the beginning, we were hearing wearing a mask is not that protective. Um, now everyone's wearing masks, right? And we understand that that's how we protect others, not necessarily about protecting yourself. Um, and so, you know, communicating that information to staff um, who remained on the front line was really challenging. And so, um, you know, like others, we, uh, especially in the beginning, we're doing a lot of all staff um, calls, webinars, and on the very first one, we found it really helpful to just take a moment um, to lean into we return to our mission and just remind ourselves um, of the importance of our work and why we're here. During a pandemic, people still need us, right? Our patients still need us. Our communities still need all of us. Um, to continue doing this important work. For many people, the care available at Planned Parenthood is not available in other places. A lot of the services we provide cannot be provided via telemedicine. They have to be provided in person. Um, and so we communicated to our staff early on that that meant our doors were going to stay open. And we also recognized um, we were gonna, need, we're gonna need to make a lot of changes to make that happen, right? Um, and we needed to make those changes with the top priority of keeping staff and patients safe um, and balancing that with a very real need to maintain access at Planned Parenthood. Um, so we did a lot of things early on, you know, promoting physical distancing and waiting rooms, robust health screenings, talking to people before they come in at the time they make an appointment, asking, um, you know, where they've traveled, have they been in contact with anyone, do they themselves have any symptoms, have they taken their temperature, um, and, and really screening to make sure that patients are appropriate for care, um, you know, without providing too much um, at risk, right, to other folks. We do the same for staff. Staff are screened before they come into work, um, and staff that have a temperature or have any other symptoms or risk of exposure um, are instructed to consult with our medical director before they come in. Um, we also implemented a strict mask policy pretty early on. Um, all of our health center staff um, have been wearing masks um, for weeks. Um, we've extended that now to all patients have to wear a face covering. Um, if staff do come into the administrative office, most of them are at home. Um, they have to wear a face covering if they're in a setting where others are, a break room, bathroom. Um, and then we leaned into, we tend to the team, right? Um, which is challenging, right, Maricela? We're not, um, we're not mental health professionals and we know people are dealing with really big issues. Um, you know, one of the very first conversations we had on our COVID-19 task force was just about recognizing that our frontline staff are heroes, right? And that they need to be recognized and that they need to be thanked and that that's not enough, right? Recognizing and thanking people um, is not enough. And we wanted to make sure that staff felt compensated um, for the work that they were doing on the front lines. Um, and so we implemented something called mission pay, which was a pretty significant pay differential, um, you know, just to really make sure that staff understood how much they were valued for the work they were doing. Um, and, uh, you know, we try and we learn, right? Um, telehealth <laughs> has been fascinating. It's really been fascinating to watch 10 years, right, of, um, of trying to, that move telehealth along and coming into barrier after barrier and all these challenges only to have the federal government and the state of California say, there are no restrictions, right? There are almost no rules. You can just do that now. Um, and so, you know, pretty much overnight, we were 
unleashed into telehealth and, um, you know, with many fewer restrictions and much more care we can deliver online. Um, and, and that's been great. We've also, I know I have some of our development staff um, in, in the webinar right now, and we've done some great, you know, virtual donor meetings. Some of those are a little clunky, right? You get uh, feedback <laughs> from your donors afterwards about your lighting wasn't good. Um, and that, it's actually really helpful, right? Like, oh, I didn't realize my lighting wasn't good, thanks. Um, uh, we, you know, we've moved a lot of our education programs online and I know we have some of our education staff on too and that's been, um, you know, challenging and, you know, the engaging with teens right now in this moment online is, it's hard, right? Even schools are, are really struggling um, to keep students engaged and so, um, you know, we're, we're really trying to figure out how do we continue to make sure teams in our community have access to the information and resources that will keep them safe in this moment. Um, you know, and then I think one other thing that we had to really try and learn was, um, was to be open about and accept our own vulnerability. Um, I'm going to tell a story with permission, and I know that the person that is the subject of the story is also on the line. Um, and, and some of our staff will recognize it. So one of the earlier um, all staff calls, um, you know, we have a, an amazing talented leader in our organization who does a lot of work with our staff around building resilience um, and, you know, in, in increasing employee engagement. Um, and she was presenting some slides on an all staff webinar, which was really about um, helping, helping develop skills so that we can all cope through this personally, right? Um, and she got to this one slide and she was comparing how, you know, how much her life had changed overnight, right? And things that she missed and people that she missed um, and how she can't see those people right now. And she got really emotional and she didn't, she didn't mean to, right? It was just a normal human reaction and she got really emotional and, um, and it, you know, it was a little bit hard for her to recover at first. And afterwards, you know, she was embarrassed and she apologized. And we were having some daily clinical services calls every day. And the next day, you know, she again was like, I'm so sorry, I'm so embarrassed. And everybody on the call said, oh my gosh, that was such a relief. Like I was, if you are struggling with this, right? And you have all these years of experience and you're such an expert in this area, that told me that I'm okay, right? Like what I'm going through is okay, that we're all struggling with this. And, um, and it was really meant a lot to people, right, to see that vulnerability. And so, um, you know, I think that's just another, another part of trying and learning. Um, you know, another piece of, um, you know, the, in this together and our values is that we respect and honor all people. Um, and, you know, look, we all know on this call that um, there's already pervasive inequality in our communities. Um, and that COVID-19 is having a very disproportionate impact um, on people of color and marginalized folks. Um, and so we have to address in our planning um, the equity piece of this, right? We have to recognize out loud um, that people of color, that marginalized folks, that people who already struggle to access healthcare um, are disproportionately impacted. Um, we heard um, make equity a standing um, agenda item um, at our task force meeting. And what that really means too is we, as we make decisions, we say um, who is burdened by this decision and who benefits, right? It's really simple just to sort of layer on that question, right? And so going back to mission pay and I saw in the chat, there was a question, so it's actually a good moment to elaborate. Uh, you know, a lot of organizations were implementing, implementing some sort of like hazard pay early on. And typically what that looks like is it's some function of your hourly rate, right? Like time in 25%, time and a half. Um, and we realized early on, right, if we did that, um, the licensed staff in our health centers who already make the most money uh, would make a lot more money. Um, and that frontline workers who don't make quite as much money but have incredibly valuable skills and who are taking the same risk as everyone else in the health center would make less. And so we decided to just do an across the board differential. And so the way that that works is um, staff who work in the health center, patient facing um, for six hours a day or less, like a half day, um, get an additional $25 on their paycheck. If they work eight hours the full day or over six hours, basically, um, it's $50 for the day. 
Um, and so it's a significant amount of money, right? And it has had an impact um, that has disproportionately benefited um, our frontline staff. Uh, and that really was the goal, right? Was to make sure that we, we did that equitably. Um, another value of ours is we jump in um, and it was you know, really interesting right out the gate to see that some of our staff had a lot more work to do, right? A lot of preparation, securing PPE, making plans, communicating with staff, we're a regional affiliate, right? We had to get supplies um, to different places. We have lots of different languages that are spoken. Patient materials were changing. People were burdened by that. And then there were other staff whose events were canceled um, who were working hard still, but differently um, and maybe with a little bit less urgency um, and wanted to help, right? And so we had staff you know, major gifts officers, um, you know, development staff standing outside at our health centers and doing health screening for patients. We had, um, you know, staff taking days to just drive supplies up and down the coast um, to make sure that all of our health center staff had what they needed. Um, and I know there are some staff on the call today, Zoe, Gloria, uh, who did that, who stood outside um, of our health centers. And, you know, I think it really sent a strong message internally too for our health center staff to see that, wow, we really are all in this together, right? Like we are, we are all invested in making sure that we um, make this mission real, even in this moment. Um, another one of our values is we care for our business. And um, we were also really fortunate to go into this crisis um, strong financially, um, but we are feeling the strain of the crisis. We're a healthcare organization, our patient visits are down. Um, Students are not in the area. People are postponing less urgent care, um, and that hurts financially. Um, and you know, we're also watching the California budget crisis, um, and you know, knowing that we're going to be impacted, um, you know, in some way or another by a reduction in rates. Most likely, we're fighting really hard to prevent that. But um, you know, we have been able to reassure our staff that we are in a position not to have to do any type of reduction. Um, before the end of the fiscal year, um, but the fiscal year ends on June 30th, right? And I know that our staff are really anxious about what happens beyond that. Um, and, you know, we as leadership have a lot of anxiety about that too, because the unknowns are huge, right? They're double digit percentage numbers. They're massive. Um, and that's hard. And, um, there's not a whole lot you can say to people, right? You can't say it's fine um, because we don't know all the answers and we're doing everything that we can um, to keep our team whole and to keep our organization strong. Um, and so, you know, we just have decided to sort of just acknowledge the reality of that and just be really transparent and say, this is the data that we're using. Um, these are the levers that are gonna help us make this decision. Um, we are making these decisions with your best interests and the organizational mission in mind. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna share the same data with you that we're sharing with our finance committee and our board um, that's going to make these decisions. And that um, has kind of been a relief, to be honest. It's just been, you know, we, we are doing the best that we can and this is how we're making those decisions. Um, and then finally, going back to how we return to our mission, um, you know, look, all of us on this call are going to be needed more than ever when this is over, and it will be over. And we know, I mean, Jeff, you said depression era unemployment, right? Looking around at how folks are impacted um, in our community, 18% projected unemployment. In every past recession, we have seen record patient numbers, right? People lose their employee-sponsored health insurance, employer-sponsored health insurance, they need us. Um, and we all have the responsibility to make sure that we're ready um, when that moment comes, because this pandemic is only exacerbating inequalities. It's only creating more need, um, and the organizations that are represented on this call are uniquely positioned um, to lift our community back up in that moment. So, um, you know, I think in, in that way, you know, as a sector, we really need to stick together um, and really be in it together to help um, to help lift the community back up when that happens. Thank you so much. Jeff, you're on mute again. Yeah, okay, thanks. <laughs> um, so I, there's a lot, a lot here, and I know we could spend a day together. So I'm gonna try to move us through a few issues, and, and you all brought up some really 
um, critical points that I know everyone would have a comment on. So I, I want to take something, uh, a thread from Jenna's comments just now and toss this back to you, uh, Sigrid and, and Maricela. And that was about the, the, the strategies, the practices that may have been long on your list of to do's or things you'd like to try or move forward. And suddenly there is an opportunity, uh, if we want to call it that, to do that. An open door, if you will, uh, and even maybe even a necessity to, to pivot on, on some of this work. So the examples I'm thinking of, Jenna was talking about telehealth, uh, which was a struggle for many to get approval uh, from authorities and now suddenly it is the way. Um, there's a few things around compensation and, and other things that people have been experimenting with. So, so Sigrid, could you comment on maybe something or some things that you had on your list that you'd love to try and now suddenly you realize this is the time as the leader of this organization to, to try it? Yeah, sure. There's so well, there's so many things that I want to respond to from Maricela and, and Jenna um, and things I want to dig into here, but just on a very practical level, um, you know, one of the things that we have wanted to experiment with that we've known for a while, as I said, that we're a very events driven organization. Um, and that has uh, that has its challenges to it. So we have um, known that we've been wanting to experiment with other ways of new communication tools um, that don't rely just on in-person gatherings. So this is, you know, as I said to the team in that first month, um, this is a, a time, an opportunity to kind of flex a new muscle that um, hasn't had a lot of flexing. Um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that the very first place where we got a chance to experiment was with Earth Day, the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Um, and we knew immediately that, um, we, you know, that with our own, um, with our own anniversary, we were going to just move that into next year and kind of take a do over, you know, next year, but that Earth Day is going to get, was going to get global coverage and that we just couldn't go dark on that. Um, so we, um, I pulled that team together. There are about 20 core, core folks and said, you know, I really, if there's an organization that I think can think, that could think creatively about how to be together in a different way, um, it would be this organization. And I gave them a, a couple of examples. Um, one I actually have a photo of, maybe Jeff, do you, if you have that someplace, but it was the, um, during the Paris yeah, climate talks. <clears throat> yeah during the Paris climate talks of 2015, there was a terrorist attack, um, some might remember, on a nightclub just prior to the talks, which meant that um, all the marches were canceled. And the really most powerful image that came out for me um, of that time was this virtual march where there were you know, about a, over 10,000 pairs of shoes that were there to kind of represent um, those of us, you know, those who couldn't be there. Um, and obviously we can't do something like that here in the pandemic, but I, I, I really was feeling that there's this kind of, um, there's a thread there about in our absence, how present we are in our absence, right? Um, the other example that I shared with that team when we were, we were thinking about how to address Earth Day was more personal. It had to do with my own wedding, which was just a, um, a week and a half after 9-11. And many people had not um, had a chance to gather at that point. Um, and I, we needed, my husband and I really needed to make space for multiple emotions. And so that, that feels like um, kind of rich content for how we are approaching and experimenting with um, being together virtually or, or not, in which it's, it's mostly not, uh, mostly virtually. Um, and, to, to do that, we started by identifying some key words um, that would be used to describe both the organization and the event that we were, the values and the tone of the event. Um, and the upshot of that is we ended up with a, with a really strong event that um, was a live action, it was a, a, a live action event. Um, we had speakers that we would not normally been able to attract, like the um, Secretary of California EPA, Jared Blumenfeld, the founder of Earth Day and so forth. We um, and it left us with a lot of content. Um, and in, in fact, actually, we had more views of that content than um, it surpassed the attendance that we would normally have it for, a, for a live event. So I, I mentioned all of that just as a deep dive into um, the um, experimenting with the new kind of communication tools and, and new opportunities. So, um, 
that, that was one thing that came up for me. There's, there's so much more just content wise in terms of um, Jenna and, and Maricela's points. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna have time. We're gonna get there. So I, Maricela, would you maybe comment on, on things that you have tried or that you have been given the opportunity to try that have long been on your, your mind, whether they be strategies or types of work. I know doing community organizing work and policy work as you do every day, there's, there's pieces of that that are probably more easily shifted to, uh, to technology and some that really aren't and, you know, door knocking, for example. So anything you want to share on, on that? And you are muted, by the way. So thank you for following my example. Uh, you're always one to follow, Jeff. Um, so um, really thinking about uh, what we were forced into. <laughs> um, and uh, one um, is um, the working from home. Um, that was not something that I ever gave thought to in terms of being in essence a standard <laughs> for um, for staff as opposed to you know um, a half day here or a half day there but the norm um, and I bring that up because um, this period of, of of COVID is expected to um, you know the disorder the chaos the uncertainty um, is expected to continue for 18 months. Um, and so um, as um, executive directors, as leaders of our um, organizations, um, post at whatever time we call it post COVID, um, I think that that's something we're going to have to um, uh, figure out um, how best to, um, to do that for the long run. You know, how much of a norm is working from home? Um, and then what does that mean in terms of letting go of office space or, you know, investing in more into people's quote unquote home office. Um, so that was a real learning for me because when I think about, you know, what, what we consider, you know, in our box, right, of like, you know, no, I'm not even going to consider that. So before COVID, the idea of how about if all staff work from home was a non-starter. It wasn't even a concept. Um, and all of a sudden, literally, from one day to the next, it's the reality. Um, and it's the only way to do things. Um, so um, yeah, figuring out how to, um, how to make that work um, and then what's gonna be the policy you know, post COVID. Um, but the other one is in terms of the, the organizing um, in terms of how when we're, for um, those of us that, yeah, uh, um, interact face-to-face -face with our constituents, um, um, it, it has relied a great deal more on technology um, with our immigrant adult leaders. We're do, using G, um, WhatsApp um, for chat groups. Um, and, you know, even with our youth, Zoom meetings with our youth. Um, but, um, you know, that, that presents its, its, uh, its challenges too in terms of how, how do you really build connection and engage people who haven't been engaged um, uh, through, through video, you know, through just phone. Um, so that's an ongoing challenge. Um, a, a wonderful uh, opening um, for innovation. If there was one policy um, pre-COVID that, you know, was on our wish list, um, but did not seem um, uh, achievable um, in the near future is now possible. And that's to make systemic reform around allowing undocumented workers into the unemployment system. So the unemployment insurance excludes, kicks out, ex uh, the word I've been using is deport. You know, we can't deport. Um, um, uh, all um, immigrants, uh, some might wish, but you know, we do it in other ways. They're um, excluded and exiled from unemployment insurance, even though they are workers and they're known to be workers. So that's actually a, a policy um, opportunity that, you know, was on that, on that wish list and that uh, COVID has actually created a, a possibility and opening to making that systemic reform at the state level. Absolutely. 
And so on that, on that note, there, that's one of probably three main areas that I hear frequently of, you know, what's going to stick when it comes to the policy conversation, what's going to shift our policy, kind of, certainly around uh, immigration and undocumented workers and their role in our, our communities and economy, certainly around access to Wi-Fi and universal Wi-Fi, which of course our country is far behind much of the developed world in. And the other is, is healthcare policy and access to healthcare. So to the extent that it's attached to your employment and suddenly you have a, a, an un, unprecedented drop in employment, what does that mean for healthcare? And of course, Jenna, you mentioned that. Um, so in all of this, this the, the tie here is all the advocacy piece and you all do advocacy work. It's part of each of your missions in different ways. Um, how, how are you viewing the role of advocacy in your work differently now than maybe you viewed it in February? Maybe Jenna, we can start start with you. I mean, you all referenced that that from 2016 forward, all of the different policy battles that we've all been been in. Um, what's what's different suddenly, or how are you approaching that in, in your work? Yeah, and one of the harder things for us to navigate was um, what to do with programs uh, that required um, door to door outreach and you know really high touch outreach in our communities. We were just position to start um, some big um, uh, canvassing projects around the census at the start of the crisis. Um, and, you know, so I think that was really challenging. This month, we should be having our capital day um, in Sacramento. And so it's, you know, it's sort of, it's different. And so, you know, when it comes to like census work, our team was really creative and created some videos of like being door to door, even though you know, there was just a video of being door to door and then was sort of aggressive on social media about, you know, pushing that content out and making sure that people still knew that they needed, you know, to complete the census and why it was important. Um, you know, we also have uh, Promotorix um, in, in Santa Maria, um, who, you know, that was really challenging because the nature of that work is they're in a group um, going door to door. It, it, it was not, you know, it did not feel defensively, uh, def defensively safe for them to continue to do that work in that way. And so, um, you know, so that team has been working on, you know, also trying to do some, you know, Zoom, you know, replicate um, that work. I think one of the bigger um, opportunities and threats of this moment is around um, the election and, you know, the real necessity of having accessible voting, you know, whether it's vote by mail, California did the right thing, um, you know, and extending vote by mail to all citizens and some other states are trying to do that. But of course, you know, there's really significant pushback to that. And we all know why, right? It's because, um, you know, certain politicians and, um, you know, certain policies rely on voter suppression, you know, to be to be passed because they're not popular. Um, and so I think we all need to be really loud about that and, um, and vocal because I think that one of my fears right now is that um, since we don't know how to do this work well, and there, you know, there, there are such high stakes um, policies and there's an election that really requires robust participation, um, you know, it's, it, uh, it, it, you know, I think it, we, we really have to not forget about that, right, and, and make sure that we really can continue to um, have meaningful engagement um, with people when we can't talk to them face to face, um, when we otherwise would, um, would knock on their door. Right, absolutely. Sigurd, what about you in the policy arena? What's, what's different in this moment? Yeah, I think there's some, um, well, the first thing I want to say is, that, you know, to Jenna's point, coming, just coming back to mission, coming back to mission, um, and that was very grounding for us because really um, the, that, the climate crisis is not on hiatus, right? So the, how to, now how do we advance climate-related policies in this time? There are some things that are kind of, um, you know, so there's some opportunities and then I have some real concerns. And the, con you know, concern on a very, on a policy level is, um, this year, uh, both the cities, the local cities and the county were all gearing up to um, revise their climate action plans. And we were, it was part of our work plan to, to really dig into that um, with them. And now all that planning process is slowed down or, or on pause. Um, you know, while we are seeing some reduction in emissions because people are staying home um, and, and not, um, 
engaging in airline flight and car travel. And that's really just not the way in which you want to, um, to kind of solve the climate crisis, right? It's been, it, it's, um, it really requires policy change. So um, those are the items that are kind of on my mind. I think that um, some of the shifts that are happening, or at least the discussions that are happening that are a lot more um, uh, kind of front and center, just a lot more present include, um, you know, conversations about the fragility of a globalized food system that feels like something that we really haven't been talking about outside of um, kind of inner circles. And now that feels a lot more present. Um, and then the conversation that has been touched on here, just how social and economic inequities are really um, exacerbating uh, or exacerbated by almost any, any crisis. And so I definitely have some concern about um, the kind of cascading effects of a public health crisis, economic crisis, and then um, in, um, environmental and climate crises all compounding each other at this point. So. So it's a balance of, of some opportunities and concerns. Some of them will have policy implications. Um, I think we're really on that knife edge right now where we could, something could incubate out of this and be, and take us forward into real true systems change. Or we could just um, kind of revert to, we wanna get back to normal. We kind of um, pick up the ideas that are laying around as Naomi Klein would say, and, um, and we end up, uh, deepening the systemic inequities that um, because we don't we don't have a path forward. So that that note is exactly where I want to go next. And I want to give Maricel, if you have more to say, I mean, uh, the advocacy policy work is so core to your work in your organization. Please do add anything you you feel uh, you'd like to. Uh, I, there's a, a next a next question attached to that that I want to go to. But let, let me give you the floor first and we'll talk a bit more about this inequality question. Okay. Um, yeah, I want to take the opportunity to, to raise up the issue of housing. Um, that, you know, one of the, the prep questions was, what, what's one of your growing concerns? Um, there is a tsunami building mm -hmm. in terms of mass displacement and homelessness. When you have people who are, are not getting their unemployment, um, unemployment is just a portion anyway, even if you are getting it. Um, when the rent comes due, you have nothing to pay it with. Um, so we started with a moratorium on, on, uh, on evictions, but eventually that moratorium will end. Um, so just wanna lift that up because all of us as nonprofits will have then, um, will be hit by some response that we have to um, attend to. So on, on the, all of these notes, actually, there, there's this question, you've all brought it up. Uh, and, and of course, for some of it, if, if you're doing work in, in a field where inequality is the landscape in which you do your work, it's hard to conceive of someone not recognizing the mass inequalities within our communities, within the country. And yet, if there's a gift in, in any of this, it's that suddenly, at least the, the conversations I've had with folks that never previously would have even acknowledged, much less engaged in a conversation around inequality, for whatever reason, they are seeing it now. Uh, and it's front and center. It may be new in their experience, but, but it's being recognized. Um, how do we navigate that, that new reality? Uh, you know, a lot of people, I think Jenna made in her, her uh, opening remarks, the, we're all in the same boat uh, kind of, uh, it, it can be a, a very empowering sort of bringing together to say we're all in the same boat and yet you see the opposite and we've all seen the, the counter to that is uh, no we're not we're on the same storm but we are definitely not in the same boat as far as the tools we have to respond so how how does this new um and again not new for you but new uh focus and spotlight on inequalities whether they be economic racial class-based gender-based access-based geography-based how how is that affecting how you think about your own strategies and work, given that each of you already do work on the question of inequality. Does that have a, a impact on strategy for, for you? Maybe Jenna, you can comment on this since you, you made reference to that term. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I think um, it, their health, health equity has been you know, a major challenge in, uh, in public health and 
um, and it, you know, it, racism and inequity is deeply embedded um, in the healthcare system, right? I mean, we know that, um, you know, black women and maternal mortality is a massive crisis that doesn't get anywhere near the type of attention that it deserves. Um, and, you know, that's, that's just sort of one example, right? And I think that in this pandemic, we have seen, um, you know, particularly when it comes to reproductive rights uh, uh, and, and gender inequality be just exacerbated because it's just another excuse, right, for politicians to deprioritize um, the rights um, uh, the, and, and health uh, of the people that they don't prioritize, right? And, and we've seen that across the board. It's, um, it's apparent. One of the first things that we experienced um, when, when there was a huge crisis around personal protective equipment, right? This country was nearly prepared um, to have every healthcare worker in the country wear a mask. We didn't have enough masks and everybody was, was scrambling. Um, one of the first things that happened was that the states that are already the most hostile um, to reproductive rights um, sent cease and desist notices to Planned Parenthood and other providers of abortion care and told them um, that abortion was not an essential service, for example, um, which meant, you know, that this time sensitive service um, could not be provided to, to people who needed it, um, which disproportionately, you know, are uh, younger uh, women um, and many times women of color. Um, and so places like Texas, Oklahoma, um, you know, were embroiled immediately in political fights. Uh, you know, I think that's the type of exploitation of a crisis that we see. We also see, you know, you can't deny that, um, number one, you know, aside from, you know, some of the biggest states like New York and Michigan with, with case numbers, um, the, the, there's a huge crisis of COVID-19 um, in the Navajo community. Nobody talks about that, right? I mean, some of the, the, la the largest case numbers are um, among the most underserved and marginalized communities in our country. Um, and I think you also just can't separate this sort of rush to reopen and go back to normal. Um, from, you know, just how casual our society can be um, about deciding whose lives, you know, are important and, and who we really are all in this together for. Um, so I think that it's important with anything um, when it comes to, you know, in inequity to, to be really outspoken about it, right? And it's just about acknowledging the reality. Don't skirt around it. We have to say it out loud. We're all seeing it, right? We all see what happened in Lompoc, for example. That's part of our community, right? And, um, and it's not okay, right? And I think that we all have a responsibility um, to make sure that, um, to make sure that this crisis um, in this crisis, we don't skirt over that reality and we don't ignore what we're seeing because otherwise, you know, it just, it won't improve. <clears throat> Thanks, Shanna. Well, Sigrid, what about you? How does the, the new focus or, or maybe new awakening for some on, on all of the inequalities affect your work and your strategies? Yeah, I think that the environmental movement has really suffered from the, um, not recognizing these concerns for a long time or recognizing them but not knowing how to address how to address them. Um, so there's been deep in, injustices and inequities in the environmental movement, um, basically since its beginning in 50 years ago. Um, I would say there's, there are some things that I've seen that have started to shift that, or at least shift the conversation. Um, one has been the youth engagement, right? In the last few years, um, bringing more youth into the environmental and climate movement. And they're, they're coming in with um, different lenses and, and really um, righteous anger and, and demanding um, uh, greater partnerships and, and engagement and addressing um, deep issues. Um, it, you know, I'm seeing it in, um, I've been particularly concerned lately, and this is one thread of concern, but particular concern lately, just in terms of those cascading and compounding effects that I spoke about earlier, in, um, as we see a public health crisis, an economic crisis, and then a climate crisis all kind of um, layering onto each other, and that even some of the um, the strategies we would use to address one or another, there, I mean, it's just become so evident. It becomes so, um, the, the, the inequities become so evident as 
you know, even just the, um, the strategy of social distancing really is a privilege, right? And, and that, remind, re, that reminds me of um, a, a conversation I had with Thomas Teig from Direct Relief um, not too long ago in which he talked about, you know, evacuation being a privilege, evacuation being a, a climate resilient strategy being a privilege. So I think there, I'm seeing a lot more just awareness at, at, at levels in, in from boardrooms to news reports um, to the streets, really just about the conversation, and I and, and I think that um, that's going to have a profound effect on a um, or could have a profound effect on a um, kind of a more nitty gritty or personal level. Um, Maricela and I have been working for the last I don't remember when we started this, Maricela. I think maybe four years ago, three years ago. Gary might remember. Um, a climate justice network, which is for the Central Coast, which is designed to bring together the social justice organizations and more traditional environmental organizations, addressing, um, getting to know each other for one thing, understanding each other's work, and then um, and then working together to learn and address um, institutional racism and and issues that I think um, you know are, are very much needed to be brought into the environmental movement. So those are a couple of places where I'm starting to see all those ties thread together. We're gonna to come back to that in just a moment because there's some questions around that partnership and, and the need for it right now. But Maricela, as, as someone who works constantly to try to highlight the inequalities, get people to see them and then react and solve, uh, does the current focus, is, is this help? Is it just overwhelm? How are you seeing it in, in your work? Yeah, um, certainly um, uh, we'll take any attention to it at any point. Um, but um, I, I do think that that um, what we need to be aware of is that, you know, it not be this sort of this, you know, very um, small window of time, right, where it surfaces and, you know, it's on, on people's minds um, for a brief time and then it, you know, peters out after a while. So um, I came up with, with three Ps since, um, PPP is being used a lot these days for different acronyms. Um, so people to people in that um, if you are interested, concerned, want to delve deeper into um, any aspect of inequality, um, at the heart, at the start, it's about people to people connections. Um, that part of inequality is keeping others as foreign um, or as distant. You know, and that includes when um, they're only, uh, they're in, in some ways relegated to this position of, um, you know, only as client, only as constituent, only, you know, where their role is sort of like, you know, to just receive, you know, from the organization. Um, and there's a real power dynamic there. So people to people in terms of inequality calls us really at um, our, our deep spiritual um, and heart level um, to, to engage with people as equals. And so what does that mean in our organizations? If we're a client serving, you know, nonprofit, you know, what are ways where, you know, we are engaging with um, our, our clients in, an, in another way um, where it's not this dynamic of I'm giving to you for as important as the service is. You know, um, as there are, you know, advisory groups, you know, is there just other mechanisms where it's about people to people connections, not, you know, our role in service to others necessarily, but like connecting. Um, so that's one. The other is pipeline for nonprofits, nonprofits throughout the state. Um, we have to um, take seriously beyond theory, beyond, you know, a webinar, a training diversity, equity, and inclusion in our staff. Um, it's not okay if all our frontline staff or, you know, the majority of our people of color in our organizations are only relegated, again, to one sec, you know, section of our organization or not at all. We are in a Latino community. 45% um, of our region is Latino. That's almost one in two. Take a look at your staff. Does that reflect that reality of our own lived experience? So the pipeline, um, inequality um, brings up issues of, of hiring, of retention, of pay, of promotion, um, all along 
um, the pipeline of our of our staff and our organizations, including our boards. Um, and and then the last is philanthropy. Um, uh, a, a, Apparently, from one statistic, um, you know, less than one percent of philanthropic dollars go to Latino-led organizations. Um, less than half a percent for organizations that focus on immigrant and refugees of all philanthropy. Um, in California, you know, one in four is immigrant. So um, PPP, people to people, our um, organizational pipelines, and a call to philanthropy for equity in their giving. Did you just come up with the PPP right there? Is that one you've used before? That it just came up with. All right, brilliant, brilliant. Um, so on that front, so you you have all referenced something uh, within the last few minutes, and we have a question, and I want to weave this all together. So it's 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 the people to people, it's the issue areas, it's that intersection of issues, uh, the intersectionality of all of our issues, really. But you mentioned the Climate Justice Network most recently. How, do, how does an organization who may not have, and how do leaders of organizations who may not have already established partnerships and good working relationships with folks and now, now recognize the value of that in this moment where we're all socially distanced, where our communication is all mediated and in the ways that we would normally build trust by getting to know each other, it's different and it may be harder. Um, it, it may be, for some it may be easier, but, but generally speaking, it's different than what we're used to. How do we go about that now? So if you, if you suddenly come to the realization that, hey, I need to work with so-and-so and I've heard their name or I've seen them or I've, but we've never gotten to know each other and yet suddenly this moment calls for us to be partners. How do you build that in this moment? I see some smiles and some nods, so I'm not sure who to pick on first. I'll take volunteers. I'll go first. Um, uh, happy to, to dive in um, uh, along those lines of people to people. Um, I, and I think though that that it 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 actually um, ties in really well in terms of, of this moment, this period, this phase of disorder and chaos. Um, social distancing is that I think we're all feeling the um, uh, the the need to connect more deeply, to connect to more people, given that we're working out of a room inside a house, and you know. Um, and in, in organizing, um, you know, at the core of it, it's what we call the one-on-one, -on -one, the personal visit. It, it is reaching out to that person who you've never talked to um, and initiating a conversation um, with no other agenda except, you know, let's connect and let's share, you know, you know your interests, your needs, my interests, my needs. Um, so it, it's not necessary to already have an agenda of like, I have that project or, you know, I want to offer you this or I need this from you. Um, but just people to people. Um, and um, I, I think that it, that it responds to this need of, of um, wanting more connection. Um, but then it's very practical in terms of needing to create um, new connections. Thank you. Yeah, I, yeah, I would. I, I mean, I completely agree on um, the value of partnerships. So I don't need to sell that because I, I think um, that's um, very clear right now. You know, I have a board member who's a former fire chief of the city of Santa Barbara, and he talks about how you don't want to meet your partners, you know, on in the middle of a disaster on the battlefield. But this is a different type of situation. And one that, um, you know, as Maricela spoke to, that we're all, we all, I think, have this deep um, uh, need for greater, greater connection. But what I was struggling with, with your question, Jeff, is really just the logistical part of it. Because I know, um, I'm, so on the one hand, we're, we're, we're craving and needing deeper connection. And yes, I would agree with Maricela, just in terms of, you know, just get started in terms of partnership building. And then on, on just a more very practical logistical side, um, A, most of us are probably still navigating and maybe just coming out of um, a free fall, right? So where we actually have the ability to put, lift our head up and look a little bit further down the horizon. So it's you know, making time for that. And then, um, and then I know I'm hearing, I'm experiencing myself and I'm hearing from a lot of people just in terms of Zoom fatigue. And it is really hard to have, um, to kind of do relationship development over, over Zoom. So, um, you know, I would be inclined to be, to be looking for um, 
just ways to, to safely engage with people <laughs> that isn't another Zoom call. Certainly. Yeah, yeah, and I have just a little bit to add to that. <clears throat> um, I mean, the truth is, I think the answer is not, we haven't really done that right yet. I, I, don't, I don't feel that we have, you know, really forged any new relationships. We have deepened some though, right? I think, you know, in navigating this, particularly in the healthcare space, um, I think <clears throat> we, you know, really had the opportunity to, um, you know, collaborate uh, with, with some, some of the hospitals, public health, you know, one of the, also it's kind of a joke, one of the earlier things that we realized was in all the rush to get the test, the COVID test, um, DCMC um, called us and told us that the swabs that are used to test for COVID are the same that Planned Parenthood uses to test for herpes, which we didn't know, um, and they really needed some, and could they have some? And so, you know, we checked our inventory and, um, and then kind of got in that habit, right, of working with the healthcare system and, and well, you know, okay, now we need some gloves and, um, and, you know, and deepening some of those relationships in the healthcare system. And so that was something good that came out of it. Um, one of the other things, though, that came up was we were in our board nominating cycle, and we actually have a significant amount of turnover um, planned for this year on our board and a number of candidates to interview. And, you know, really varying degrees of closeness to the organization where, you know, some of the folks that we were talking to, we knew really well, they've already served on committees where other folks are a little bit newer to the organization. Um, and we really needed to spend some more time with them. And so the question came up, like, do we postpone this? How do we, you know, do we try to renew people and, and postpone the whole thing? And we decided, no, you know, we would move forward and we would just move the interviews um, to Zoom. And, um, you know, so I think that's something that we're sort of in the middle of navigating still because it, it's going to be interesting, I think, to have, I think, five or six new board members who we, some of us haven't met in person um, and we're, we're not going to be able to bring them on and orient them in the way that we would. And, you know, we won't be able to break bread with them and, you know, get to know them on a personal level in the same way. So um, we're spending a lot of time trying to think about that, you know, how to build a cohesive um, board uh, in a, you know, in a format where we really can't spend time together. So I, I think that, you know, we're all kind of still on that learning curve. And I suspect just like, you know, how good we're all getting at Zoom, we will start to figure some of that out. Jeff, can I, yes. can I add a couple things quickly? First of all, um, uh, we also started employing the, um, the breakout rooms in our board meetings as well, because that we're knowing that people are needing that social connectivity. But if I could just um, widen out just for a second, Jeff, <clears throat> and, you know, to your point about the need, the, the importance of partnership and networking, that I really do not see our community um, navigating its way out of this situation without really deep collaboratives. Um, we have some great elected leaders. Um, you know, we've got some leadership gaps in a few places, but we do have some strong leaders. Um, but I, it's going to take, uh, it really is going to take um, local government, the social sector, and the business sector working together. And for that, we're gonna just have to, we're, we'll have to figure out the logistical aspect of it in order to, to really deepen that. I sat down with a, um, a partner the other day and we mapped out, it was more than 20 networks that we know of that already exist. And so if those, if just even, um, you know, delegates coming out of some of those networks could start talking with each other, I know it's one more thing for us to do, but I just don't see us navigating a massive public health, economic, and environmental crisis simultaneously without, without really digging in. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's, a, it's something I've, I've certainly reflected on, but I've heard it reflected back in many contexts that the, uh, and, and Maricela, you mentioned it in your opening remarks, you know, we, we're sort of veterans now of all of these uh, layered on disasters in recent years. And one of the benefits of that is I think of Thomas Fire and, and Debris Flow in particular, we, we saw very starkly what wasn't working in our network, our systems that weren't talking to each other, that weren't well coordinated, that weren't relevant on the ground in, in the ways that we thought they should be. And there was a, a rewiring, if you will, of the entire nonprofit sector around that time, and at least in certain sections. And as we walked into this, uh, or rather this smacked us in the face, I guess, 
um, those those popped up. They they had lasted a couple of years, and and people were in a different place to pick up the phone and know who to call and such. And I just want to acknowledge that a lot of our sector has has done that, and there's obviously more to do. All right, we're getting near the end of our time, and I, I want to make sure that there's uh, time. I got a couple more questions, and I want to do maybe a, a lightning round. Um, so so I'm going to ask it in a pair, and then I'll ask each of you to go ahead and uh, give me your give me your best. Best thoughts on this. The pair of questions are, one, what's gonna stick? I mean, we're 10 weeks into this. Uh, as, as many of us have referenced, this is many months to go. Who knows, who knows what goes back to a previous normal, what becomes a new normal. But you know, we've, when we look back 10 years, I think we're all gonna refer to this time of innovation and all the things that were created and tried. What's gonna stick for you and your organizations uh, going forward that you know, even if we get back to you know, February 2020 normal, What's going what's gonna to stay changed? What are, what are the things you've tried or had to try that you believe now, looking back, will, will work better for you regardless of what the landscape is? Uh, okay. I'll look at you, Sigrid. You've got your... Uh, your, okay. your I'm unmuted. <laughs> You're unmuted. Uh, yeah, I do think the work from home strategies and, um, and then providing some support to uh, large companies and others who are also dealing with that issue and then and having and and working with folks to see that not only as a public health strategy but as a climate strategy i might see that maintaining for a while i think we all we did a giant experiment here and you know i think those uh, tools are with us to stay uh jenna i know you got you looks like you got kicked off the uh, video link but you're on the phone there what, what's going to stick for you for planned parenthood yeah, I mean, I, I think we had also just sort of started really running into not having enough administrative space. Um, and, you know, I know um, our staff are really enjoying in a lot of ways, not all of them, um, <laughs> but many of them really enjoying, um, you know, working from home and having some of that flexibility. Um, we're also an organization that has struggled with staff having really long commutes because we are regional and so i think having some more of that um, flexibility um, i think there's also some opportunity in that as well uh, you know thinking about having maybe a larger talent pool to pull from if you know if we're not so reliant um, on staff being in the office then that means that you know, we can we can maybe have some more staff that are telecommuting and, and don't even necessarily have to live in the area um, to work for us. Um, so I think that there's some some opportunity there. And then I think on the telehealth piece, you know, I think I think it's going to be really hard to roll back um, a lot of what uh, has been implemented in the past eight weeks. I think providers are really embracing telehealth. Patients are certainly um, appreciating the convenience um, and access. And so I you know I think that is here to stay. Thank you. We're going to see if we get you back on video too. Uh, Maricela, what, what's going to stick for a cause for you? Yes. Um, I'm going to take that very popular answer of, I don't know yet. <laughs> um, we are just going to start. Um, uh, we have our, our mid year staff retreat next week, and we're including visioning time there. Um, one of the differences between suffering and vain and suffering that becomes labor pains of creating new life mm -hmm. is vision. A crisis is a time for us as institutional leaders, as community leaders to hold vision, to include more people in visioning. We have to get clear for ourselves, our own lives, for our staff, for our organizations, for the people we serve in our communities what vision does this crisis actually help us to, to clarify, to have a greater commitment to? Because if we don't have that vision and hold it and bring ourselves around it and bring um, connect to people with it, the default is a future that's actually worse mm -hmm. than what we've come from. So as much as this is a time for immediate response and experimentation, this is an important time for visioning. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right. I, I, I know we're at time, but I know people are still hanging on with us. Um, this has been wonderful. So I, before we go, I want to ask each of you uh, one closing question, give you a chance to say any final words, and we'll, we'll turn it over to Gary Clark. 
uh, to close this out. But the question is, you are all leaders of organizations. You've all spoken about your role in taking care of your, your teams, uh, your coworkers, your communities. Uh, how do you take care of yourself so that you can keep doing the work? And any final thoughts that you'd like to share? So it's a twofer. Uh, now that we got you back, Jenna, we're gonna start with you. Oh, but you're still on mute. Oh, it says I'm unmuted now. There we go. I was yes. on, I, okay. What was the question? Was it about self care? How do we? Yeah. So how, I mean, you all take care of everyone around you. How do you take care of yourself yeah. so you can keep working? And then any final thoughts before we close out today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will, I'll just say two things. The first thing um, really quickly is exercise. Jeff knows I am really into uh, my Peloton. Uh, it's been a total lifesaver. I feel like it was another advantage that I walked into this crisis with was the at home workout routine that I really like. Um, and then I think the other thing <clears throat> is taking time off. I was really resistant to do that initially because we were all working so hard. Um, and I actually had a moment where um, I, I could tell I wasn't, you know, I wasn't making decisions in the in the clear way that I wanted to. Um, and I realized that, you know, I wasn't setting a good example. And I, uh, I took a Friday off, I just took a three day weekend once. And I felt so much better. Um, and then, you know, I started having conversations with my team too about doing that just because we're spending more time at home or just because we're working differently doesn't mean we're practicing self care. Um, and we have to be really deliberate about doing that. So that, you know, doing that and leading by example. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, Maricela, how about you? How do you take care of, make sure you, you're revived and can continue and uh, any final thoughts? Yeah. Um, well, I have a six-year-old at home. He'll be six next Wednesday. Um, I have to say he helps me because he's all play and that's awesome. Um, so um, for folks that don't have kids, joy, like being intentional about connecting to joy um, and, and playfulness in, in, in some way. Um, and another ritual is because a lot of our work as, as leaders is like continues in our head, you know, like even once we shut off the computer or not talking to anybody, um, a, a, a ritual at the end of the day of, of just saying I've, I've done what I could today. It'll be here tomorrow. Um, and that helps. It helps to shut off the mind. Thank you. Sigrid. Beautiful. Um, well, anything that can get me outdoors um, right now, so, hi, you know, hiking, walking or whatever, but right now gardening. So, and that gives me a great sense of ac accomplishment <laughs> that I like to grow my own food. Um, and then I would say that there, the maintaining some amount of kind of social connectivity or social connection um, with folks and I've felt very fortunate that there are a number of people in my life, um, colleagues, friends, who reach out and, and really ask how they can support. And even if I don't necessarily take them up on that, just having that offer, because this really can be a pretty lonely job. And right, and as somebody said, I think it was Jenna at the beginning, we didn't get the manual for how to lead in a pandemic. So we are definitely, um, you know, flying our little spacecraft sometimes, tr just trying to navigate new, new territory um and then in the end that that um those types of connections really again as back to my original theme that's what not only builds personal re resilience but community resilience and um so those those are my kind of go-to strategies thank you well i i just want to say i am so grateful to each of you for your work your friendship your colleagueship. Um, the organizations, of course, are all critical to our community. Uh, this has been a lot of fun, actually. Uh, and to hear each of you share your, your wisdom and your reflections has been wonderful. So I want to thank you all. I want to thank uh, Maricela Morales, Executive Director of CAUSE. I want to thank Jenna Tosh, President and CEO of our Central Coast Planned Parenthood, and Sigrid Wright, the CEO of Community Environmental Council. Uh, and I know there's more to talk about. Maybe we'll find ourselves back here sometime soon. Uh, but thank you, thank you, and thank you. And I'll now turn it over to Gary Clark. Yeah, so uh, I'm Gary Clark. I'm the director of the Collaboration for Social Impact at the Santa Barbara Foundation. 
And I have to say that's the best 90 minutes that I've spent on Zoom since I started my relationship with Zoom. <laughs> so thank you so much. And I wanna echo one of the comments by one of our attendees, Meryl Brown, who really appreciates the transparency that uh, the panelists have shared. So um, thank you so much, Jenna, Maricela, Sigrid. Um, our community is really blessed to have your leadership in our community, so thank you so much. And thanks to our expert moderator, Jeff Green. And thanks to our sponsors, Montecito Bank and Trust and Ventura Community Foundation. And then a special appreciation goes out to the co-conveners uh, from the Capacity Building Collaborative and that's CLU Center for Nonprofit Leadership, Nonprofit Resource Network, Santa Barbara Foundation, the Fund for Santa Barbara, Leading from Within, Association for Fundraising Professionals, Just Communities and Visionality. Um, I just do want to share that there are a few upcoming webinars um, this afternoon. The Fund for Santa Barbara is hosting community organizing in a pandemic and beyond with Hazel Davalos and Lucas Zucker of Cause. And then the Light Gabler HR Law Firm is hosting the good, the bad, and the pandemic. Where are we now and where do we go from here? And that's on May 27th. And then on June 3rd, we have board recruiting in 2020 with Envision Consulting. And on June 11th, we have the State of Philanthropy and Capital Campaigns with Becca Merrill and Steve Wilmont of Netzel Grisby and Associates. So thank you again, everyone for attending and we hope to see you on one of the upcoming webinars. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.